definitely not uh, shut up and dribble. Co-hosted by Zach Cohn and Jordan Bohannon. Zach, formerly from Barstool, Iowa. Obviously, you all know Jordan, the outspoken point guard from the Iowa Hawkeyes. I'm the guest, Rick Carter. I'm sure this is going to be fun. Let's knock it out. Appreciate out you coming on. It's, uh, we've known each other for, what, five, six, seven years probably now, I think. It's been a while. I mean, honestly, like, I got to know you through Nate Hutchison when I had him at Western Michigan, and he talked about you as an eighth grader. And I think we talked your, when yeah, you were Yeah, it was grade, probably way back honest. then. But I know our, our relationship kind of started way back in, I, I think it probably excelled probably sophomore, junior year when I was on the recruiting field, and you started recruiting me as Xavier when you were coaching with, uh, with Coach Mack at, at Xavier. For sure. Yeah, no question. Like, it was you and then you had another teammate that we that we were looking at. But obviously, like, we needed a guard, so I knew about you a little bit. You got hurt. But other than that, like, you honestly would have been a great Big East guard. I could have got you at the call if you came on. <laughs> we actually – so uh, we'll, we'll dive into uh, who you are <laughs> and how we met. Um, but so people that don't know you, you coached uh, at DePaul a few years back. You've coached several places across the country. And you've had a lot of experiences, a lot of – um, a lot of experiences under your belt and um, have made a lot of connections in the college sports um, realm of things. So I'm sure you have a lot of stories you can tell further in the, in the episode, but um, let, let, let everyone uh, kind of just tell everyone who you are and how you started uh, coaching at the college level and, and kind of your um, growth to, yeah, your, your story. My story. Yeah, that's so I started coaching basketball, ironically enough. My father was like hounding me to get a job when I was in college. So I was a sophomore in college and literally I'm on the, I'm on the phone with him and I stopped at a stoplight. And he's like, dude, you got to get a job. This is stupid. You're wasting time. And I looked to my left and there was a middle school sitting like, like there on the corner and it said eighth grade coach wanted. So I went in and I applied for the job and like these dumbasses hired me because like the next day was tryouts. <laughs> So like I became an eighth grade coach and I had no idea what I was doing like whatsoever. Like I was completely kind of clueless to like, I mean, I knew basketball because I played in high school, but like I definitely wasn't qualified to be a coach by any means. But long story short, the varsity coach from the team, the middle school team I was coaching, his brother was on the board of trustees at Michigan State. So I ended up getting to know him really well, started working with him after that season. And then I got full access to Michigan State because of that, where I was going to school. And then I had an AAU team. So tell, tell us. Tell us about your grad assistant at Michigan State and kind of learning from Tom Izzo and his staff and how that helped you grow into the coach later yeah. and once you got to DePaul being an associate head coach. So Coach Izzo was great. I mean, obviously, I went to Michigan State, and like I was saying, when I was a high school coach, I would go to their practices all the time. And, like, I would beg, basically, to be on the staff in some regard. Like, I, I was, like, literally offering my services for free to be a manager. And Izzo would always tell me, you don't want to be a coach. You don't want to be a coach. Like, just honestly, like, stick to what you're good at, like, business degree, whatever. And um, I started coaching AAU, and I had Drew Neitzel, Al Horford. I mean, I had a, I had a yeah. really good team. So, obviously, like, Drew Neitzel was going to Michigan State. I had a couple other guys, Paul Davis, go there before, whatever. So, when I was graduated – he gave me the graduate assistant position and that honestly obviously changed my life more than anything else. Because like what I learned very quickly is that coaching, <laughs> coaching college basketball is just not coaching basketball. Like coaching basketball is 10% of your job. You know what I mean? Like when you're coaching, you're so, you wear so many other hats that it's stupid. And it's honestly one of the bones that I'll pick with you guys later. Like coaches are not overpaid by no means. And they're not overpaid for the number one reason is job security is so poor that you better get paid a lot early on because when you get fired, you got to have it in the bank. But we can keep moving forward. And, like, as a coach, you literally have to wear so many hats. And Coach Izzo just taught me more than anything. Like, you uncover every stone. And the most important thing in the whole deal is that you have an honest relationship with the people that you're coaching. And it's both ways. Like, they can challenge you. You can challenge them. But you bring work ethic to the, like, table every single day. You outwork people. And you just have a true relationship with How the people was, you coach. How uh, was Drew Knight so loved watching him play? He played against my brother when he was at Wisconsin. So every time they played Michigan yeah. State, I was tuned in and I loved watching him play, especially how how well he moved off the ball. 
how how was his transition from high school to playing at Michigan State, and how how much did you see his his growth take off from from high school to college? Yeah, so it's interesting because I got to start working with Drew when he was a ninth grader. So like on my AU team, like when I was a high school coach, literally my first job, like I met Drew at my very first open gym for this AU team. He was talking about getting this dumb tattoo on his arm, and I was like, dude you're an idiot. Like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. And his dad was like, you got to work with them because no one else tells him the truth. Right. So like, I literally saw Drew from ninth to 12th grade grow as a human. And he was literally like my little brother. Like it was very difficult for me to be in coaches meetings and people to talk shit about Drew. Right. Cause I'm like, wait, dude, like I've worked with this kid since he's been a ninth grader. Like you're dumb. You don't know what you're talking about. Drew was awesome. Um, the hard thing for him more than anything, like a lot of people, and he probably wouldn't even tell you this, but when we were to the final four, he, want, he was miserable. Like, he, like so much pressure had been put on him because he was a starting point guard as a freshman, and he went from scoring 38 to 40 points a game to just having to get rid of the ball and just dealing with, like, the pressure of Tom Izzo, you know, like holding you accountable to the nth degree, especially when you go to a Final Four. So, like, it was a really tough thing, and he was playing on two hernias. Like, he had, he had two different hernias that he had ruptured, I guess, that he had to have surgery on after the season, and he really didn't find out about it until, like, two weeks before – we went to the final four. So that had been bothering him the whole year, but it was cool to see him grow up. And more importantly, it was cool to see Tom Izzo hold him accountable to a standard that he probably didn't like, but it made him who he was later. Like he wouldn't have had his junior and senior year if it wasn't for that. Since you have experience coaching and you know, you said you started at the middle school realm, one of the you know, high school varsity and stuff like that for the coaching styles. I know Jordan, you may have your own opinion. What kind of style do you think is more effective with kids these days because there's the guy who's more, I'm your best friend, hands off, like, you know, I want to be everyone's friend. And then there's the hard ass, the Tom Izzo's, as we've seen in the past, yeah. you know, quote unquote hitting the players and stuff like that, which is pretty soft. But what kind of coaching style do you think works the best? And Jordan, <laughs> which do you think works the best for you? I think it's a combination of both. Like, if you're going to coach someone hard, you, they have to know that you care about them and like you have to invest in them. Like you have to talk to them. Like you got to know other things. You just can't coach someone about a sport. You know what I mean? Like to me, when you become a coach, like it is, and I, I probably recruited you this way, Jordan. So like, I think you'll probably understand this. It's one of those things where you like, you develop a relationship with someone and you really know like what can push them to the limit and then what's going to break them. And you're kind of pulling puppet strings sometimes, but more importantly, like you care about them and they care about you. And ultimately when that's the case, you can coach them any way you want. Like you can look at him and say, dude, you're playing like a B word. You know, you're not, you're not playing tough. Like you can say whatever you want to them because they know that you care about it. Like to me, as long as you do that, you can coach someone any way you want. It's funny you bring up the relationship, how we were when you recruited me, when you're at Xavier and DePaul, because you were one of the, I think the only coach in the country that granted I didn't get looked at by a lot of schools, but one of the only coaches in the country that sent me workouts on what, you wanted me to work on what your guys were playing to work on an upcoming workout or something. And I thought that was the coolest thing ever because I was like nonstop. I was a sponge in high school. I wanted to learn about new workouts. I want to do all these things to try to get my game to the next level. And it's funny you mentioned that because I feel like when you did that, I feel like you truly cared about me, not only as a player, but as a person and trying to excel for me to get to that next level and try to, for me to have the best college I can with the skill level I can develop. I mean, at the end of the day, in my like the kids that I kind of mentor now that are going through the process, I always tell them like, when you're getting recruited by a school, you ask them who have they had like you, and then the greatest question you can ask is, okay, well, when they struggled, how'd you help them? Because at the end of the day, like that's really what you're looking for, right? Like you're going to go through some tough times. Well, the only way that's ever going to work is if you have a relationship with that person and they know that you truly care. So like it, I mean, you having success at Iowa is awesome. Like I cheer for you every time I watch you play, along with a lot of other people that I recruited, because like I wouldn't be real if when I recruited you, I was just doing it to have you come to DePaul. Like that doesn't seem very. I totally fair agree in the too, and it's funny because uh, I was I was looking back and at just kind of where I was junior year, senior year, and how I was trying to get to that next level, and um, you mentioned that. If I didn't go, if I was going to go on your visit, then I was more than likely going to commit to DePaul. And it's funny because I remember I was scheduled to make that visit the weekend. I yeah. think I got offered by, yeah, I was that offered week. by Iowa Wednesday, yeah. I think, or Thursday. And I was supposed to go that weekend to go to DePaul. 
and you had me set up, I think, arriving on Friday. So it was literally two days later. So I can only imagine if Coach McCaffrey didn't come in and offer me a spot in my dream school where I could have been two days later after that visit. No, it would have been wild. I mean, it was really kind of cool for you, though, just because knowing your dad's story and, like, your goals, to be able to play at Iowa, obviously, is an unbelievable, like, I don't want to say accomplishment because you earned everything you got, but, like, there was no way that if you would have called me and said, well, what do you think? I could have, like, literally tried to convince you, oh, no, I have a better option for you. <laughs> and, like, I don't even care where I was at, you know? Like, that was an unbelievable story, and obviously it's worked out for you. Yeah, me, me and Jordan have talked about even in the last episode, this almost butterfly effect, he told me that he was getting looked at at some other schools like UNI and I think Drake and stuff like that. And he got injured and he was horseshit. It was horseshit. Like I listened to the episode. I'm like, this dude isn't going to say he was going to go to Nepal. Like I got to hear about like Lehigh and fun. I mean, it was, in it. yeah. Like that was, yeah. Well, Jordan, Jordan, you know, he's revenge games against you and I, and he doesn't even bring up to Paul. What kind of shit is that Jordan? I wouldn't, Low key though, I wouldn't admit that either if I was him. I, I totally it's okay. Understand. Jordan can't handle Chicago. It's the city's a little too tough for a little. Well, I can't win to Paul beat us last year, so I can't mention DePaul. <laughs> <laughs> I, I totally I get, it. About I get it. I totally I understand. <laughs> I was like, Jordan's gonna kill these dudes. Oh wow, heartbreaker. <laughs> we talked about kind of my steps going forward to committing to Iowa and I don't know if you did tune into our last podcast, but I talked about how you and I and Drake pulled my scholarship after I got hurt in a U tournament going into my senior year. So I was down to limited options, as you knew, know, Coach Carter, and um, I was kind of struggling on yeah. where I was going to go and kind of just bringing up that about kind of the shady side of college sports and how things can happen like that to just these young kids where – just out of nowhere, a scholarship could be pulled to a school they think they could have went just because they found someone better, or might suit their um, style a little better than someone they originally recruited. When you were recruiting, how much have did you deal with that, and how do you how do you go about your recruiting? Because I know you're you pretty much handled mid rest recruiting from what it sounds like. Again, I just try to be really honest with people. You know, like my whole thing was I was going to tell you exactly what we had for you, and then. I was probably going to talk to you about the school that I was at early on, like maybe the first call. And then from that point forward is more just about like life and what's going on. And then if decisions were going to happen, obviously, like I would interject, like, well, I think we have this, this, and this, but at the end of the day, I think anytime you deal with recruiting, if you're not honest with people and let them know where they're, where, where they stand in the long run, you're going to get screwed over. So like, if you tell a kid, Oh, you're going to come and be my starting point guard. Right. And then they get there, they're not the starting point. They're like, well, they're not going to trust you later on. So, like, how am I going to get you to understand that you have to jump to the ball? Like, you're not going to trust me because I lied. You know what I mean? So, at the end of the day, that's kind of how I always handled it. And I always let people know, like, this is our depth chart. Like, you have an offer. If I'm going to offer someone else, I'm going to tell you. But, like, that's where a head coach and assistant coach relationship is so important. Because at the end of the day, what happens is the head coach, he gets anxious. He wants to get a commitment. And it puts a lot of pressure on an assistant. So like, well, we have these three offers out. How am I going to handle it? And to me, the best way to handle that was honesty on both sides with the head coach along with the kid, because I'd had, I never had any problem telling a kid, you might want to commit some, like, this might not work out. Like this might not be a good place for you. This other one is better. How much that did, was just who I was. Cause I heard about this from a couple of people that I've known that played college basketball, whether it was my brothers or people that they played with. Um, how much did not really peer pressuring the recruit to commit on spot because I've heard many stories about them getting into the office of the head coach and the head coach pretty much selling all this stuff and kind of asking an open-ended question at the end so what do you think how much did that (laughs) did you experience that if at all and how much have you heard of any stories that that made it happen so when I was at Michigan State we already, we, we would get kids to commit because it was like a destination spot at that point. Right. So like before their junior year, they had committed, which crazy is when I got to Fairfield, my first job, I never been a part of an official visit where a kid hadn't oh. made his decision yet, which is kind of weird, right? Like as Michigan state, everyone made their decision before they right. came on their official. That was like more of a celebration. So my first head coaching job, I worked for Ed Cooley at Fairfield. He's now the head coach of Providence. And to be honest with you, He's truly the best recruiter that I've ever been around and it's genuine. But what you kind of said, you alluded to it earlier where you said the open-ended question at the end, 
we were literally like seven for 10 on recruits that came on visits. Like Ed was phenomenal at closing and it was just him and the kid. So no one really ever knew what happened, right? Like just the kid would come out. He said he was committing. So I had asked Ed probably about three years ago. I'm like, dude, how did you get all these kids to commit? Cause we we're at Fairfield. We sucked. You know what I mean? Like we were taking over a program that was, they had three wins the year before and we had six kids commit. And like Ed literally like changed that program kind of with his energy because he didn't know what coaching was yet. He was just coming from a recruiting role. But I say all that because, like, he knew how to close. And when I asked him, he said, I asked him open-ended questions. I was like, well, you know, what coach do you vibe with more than me? And you're sitting with a 19 or 18, 17-year-old kid, and what are they going to say? Of course they're going to say it's him, right? Like, they're not going to say, oh, no, I like the coach from wherever better. Like, they're going to they're gonna agree with him. And then it's like, well – you spend this whole weekend with their players, you know, did, did, did you like them? Could you see yourself playing with them again? Like this dude's not saying no, he's going to say yes. So you keep building it up with all these positives. And then at the end, you're like, well, what are we doing here? Then if, if, if it's all yeses, why don't we get your parents on the phone or your mom and dad or center here? Why do you commit right now? And they would always commit. It was crazy. You know, it was wild. And when I say all that, Ed Cooley is also one of the recruiters. He taught me that caring about the person and getting to know them really matters. Like, it can't be fake. So when he would go down that path, like, it was unbelievable, like, our success rate. From there on out, like, when I went back to Western Michigan, that was different, you know, in recruiting. And I don't think we ever got anyone just to – we never pressured someone to commit, ever. Missouri and Xavier and DePaul were just different. High major school, I I just think it's different. Would you say that a lot of the people, when they go through that process with the open-ended questions, through your whole experience with coaching, do most people commit on that trip, kind of get the – not peer pressure, but feel the, you know, everything is making sense. It seems like all the guys like me and this is a great spot. Or does most of the time they go home and mull it over with their family? I mean, it's 50-50 probably, but like if you have someone that's going to come in on the visit, like it's very, there's nothing bad about it. Like the whole thing's scripted out, right? Like you literally get to have the best time of your life. Like, and it's like designed for you. You know, the whole thing, it's like a weekend like designed around you. So, I mean, that's not even a difficult thing to get, you know. If a kid yeah, likes it, he's probably you, like you do. Out. So you talk about designing that weekend out. I didn't, like I said, you were going to be the first, your, you, your school in DePaul was going to be the first visit I was going to take. So I didn't take an official visit yet. And, and then I will offer me. So I didn't really go through the official visit process before I committed. And I went through the official visit yeah. at Iowa and it's literally scripted out. Now that I've hosted recruits at Iowa too, I realize how much every single second is scripted out and everything well, is right. catered to these guys to make sure they have the best time of their lives. For the people who are outside perspective like me, how would you guys describe, can you get in more detail about these scripted uh, visits to these schools and the kind of itinerary and things you guys do during these visits, Jordan, from a player? <laughs> you, eat, you, eat, you eat, you eat, and you eat, and you eat, and you eat so much, it's stupid. Like you eat so much that when you're like, dude, we got to eat again. Like, what are we doing? Oh, let's just go eat. It's like, what the fuck? Like, I can't eat anymore. Like, these people have been on campus for 48 hours. Like, how much more can we actually digest? That is, that is so true. You eat much so you much. Eat. When when you're when I was hosting a couple of recruits, how much we go <laughs> we go eat places? It's unbelievable. <laughs> it's wild. And if you think about it as a coach, like, what are you trying to do? Well, one, you ask the kid like what he likes, what his parents like, whoever else is on the visit, what they like. So you're trying to show that you have all that there. And then in between that, you have these segments of like, okay, we're going to talk about style of play or how we're going to develop you or your major. You're going to go meet with the president of the university. So you do all those things because, again, you're checking off boxes. Okay, so for mom, academics is really important. Well, dad loves football. We got to get him over. You know, he played here. We got to get him over the football field. We have to have, have, have him talk to the head coach of the football team, whatever. But all of it is like, I mean, you literally, guys, we would have meetings and you sit there and you talk about it. Like, and you're like, no, bad idea. Let's do this. Or, you know, Benny Hanna is not available. So where are we <laughs> going to go to have Chinese food? Because that's his favorite food. You know, it's just like the dumbest stuff you'd ever imagine. It's just like a lot of like guy flirting. Is that kind of what it is, Jordan, from your perspective? Is it just trying to basically flirt with these guys to get him to go to your I mean, school? You can put it like that, that. But from my standpoint, no pun intended, it's the, the sales pitch. That's what it is. It's college basketball. And there's outrageous amount of money that's generated off these incoming recruits. and. I don't know how Coach Carter feels about where I stand on most of my, my opinions on NCA, but I mean, it's really just a big sales pitch and whoever has the best sales pitch gets the recruit. Or the most money. Money. And, it's, 
And well, honestly, though, what it's also no different from like a Fortune 500 company recruiting a person, you know, or like now these tech companies, like I own an app now. So like my developer was Facebook came in and tried to hire him. And like when they fly him out, like what they do, like so many things are based off mm-hmm. athletics. I mean, if you look at Grand Canyon University, they're now treating the recruiting process for regular students just like they do athletes. Like they fly them out. There's a person that like hosts them. They show them around. They pay for their meals. Like it's wild. And it's a, it's a literally for-profit university because athletics is a great place to kind of take, I don't want to call it mark. Well, it is probably marketing, but it's a great place to take recruiting. Like those kind of ideas are going on there all the time for your regular students. Yeah. So my perspective and my standpoint, I, the whole thing with college athletics and recruiting and stuff like that, it's such a broad, the whole thing to me that's just really interesting is that, do you think a majority of the time these kids are picking these schools because they really resonate with them and stuff a lot? Or do you think that if you have Kentucky and you have Kansas and you have Duke, like all offering you, is it, I think it's mainly about the money and the incentives and stuff like that from a person in your perspective and have has seen the whole landscape is that stuff a real yeah. thing within the world? Um, I, well, I would say that probably nothing's off the table when it comes to that level. Um, obviously, we saw that with the whole HBO documentary and like everything that happened with the F- well, everything the FBI presented, but nothing happened to it. Um, so I think that's re- that's real for sure. I would say that at the end of the day, a kid normally chooses a school because I think the number one factor comes to distance from home, and then his relationship with that staff. And to kind of go back to what Jordan said earlier about his views with the NCAA and where I stand with that, I think you're 100% right. Like, I think name, image, and likeness is something that every athlete should have the ability to make money off of. Um, I think where you're 100% right and really haven't really vocalized this yet is that people really don't understand the amount of money that football and men's basketball bring to a university. And that all these other Olympic sports, like, they're really there because – these two sports are going on. So those people probably should be compensated a little bit differently in, in a variety of ways. And back in the day, they were like, that's, they traveled better. Like they had better hotels. Like they were just different. Well, nowadays that's not the case. Like women's soccer is going to literally travel the same way that men's football or men's basketball is. And I don't necessarily know if that's right because we just saw it with COVID football. Wasn't going to play. Well, guess what? All these other sports weren't going to play. And it had nothing to do with the disease. It had everything to do with the schools couldn't afford to have them play because football wasn't playing. And like, that's crazy to think about. Like if you can't compensate those guys differently, then what are we really doing here? Like, honestly, like it doesn't really make sense. It's tough from thinking about the NCAA perspective. I I always try to put myself in their, their shoes and how they think. And I'm, and obviously they try to make everything because of title nine, but everything kind of has to be equal and how much money is going through each sport and how you travel, like you said, is going to be the same way as women's soccer. So it's hard from thinking from their shoes, how are they going to say everything's going to be so equal and then decide that universities can compensate men's basketball way differently than girls soccer and how they travel. Like it's not, it's not fair from that perspective. And I totally understand that, but also how how is there a way to i mean i, I always use name image as likeness as a gateway well if it's if that's right. the case and let these athletes make money so you don't have to worry about all the compensating different different sports and have to worry about having it not be equal cuz really that's not have to that name image likeness has nothing to do with the personal the 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 universities and it's more of outside and making money in the public well i think here lies the biggest issue with name image and likeness is and I've I've actually listened to all your guys' podcasts and you guys talked about at one point, like again, I said it earlier, coaches' salaries. And Zach, I think you had mentioned before that a coach might make this much on paper, but all these other things are hidden behind the scenes that he's making, right? Well, that's just not true. So what you see is what he's getting. Now, here's the problem. High V might be paying of his two million dollars five hundred thousand. Nike might be paying one point five million. Okay. The school's probably only paying 300 grand. Like if you really, and they're all public record, like what the school actually pays is little. It's not a lot. It's literally everything coming from sponsors for coaches, for the head coach that is. The assistance is different, obviously. That's in their budget. But I say all that because name, image, and likeness now comes into effect, right? So let's go back to this high V example. Well, Jordan, what's another grocery store around Iowa City? Or, uh, um, yeah, Iowa City. Um, Trader Joe's. So if you get uh... a sponsorship from Trader Joe's, 
and High V has one with the school, that becomes a major conflict of interest because they're paying a quarter of the football coach, a quarter of the basketball coach, a quarter of the soccer coach. A quarter. So that becomes a problem. Now let's go into Nike. If all of a sudden Adidas comes in and says, hey, you played first for AAU, we're going to give you a $3 million contract for Adidas. Well, guess what? That's a major problem because the women's swimming team is getting sponsored by Nike. Do you really think they're going to have the most vocal marquee guy at Iowa wearing Adidas when Nike's sponsoring all these other schools and or all these other sports and losing money? Let me help you with this. Here's the answer. Fuck no. Like, that's not going to happen. You know what I'm saying? So, like, that's the biggest problem. And you've, you've alluded to this in COVID, and you're right. The biggest issue in all of this is the lack of direction from leadership, right? Like, it really just comes down to that. Like, if you guys can't sit down as a group of people and come up with things that are fair for everyone, like, what, what are we doing here? Like, that's your job. You know, like, truly, that's what they're there to do. And we have a, in men's basketball, we had a rule book that was 500 pages, like, thick. Well, it was all by interpretation. So one school could think of it one way, and another school could think of it totally different. And guess what? The other school that found the gray area was okay. Like, they weren't breaking a rule. Well, yeah, you are. Like, that's not fair, like, what you're doing, but whatever. So that's my whole kind of point is, like, the NCAA is whack. They don't give good guidance. They leave things for interpretation. And then at the end of the day, if they don't agree with it, they punish you for it. Jordan's even touched on this with these gray areas, right, that they have these rule books, they have these blanket statements, and however you want to interpret it, like you said, is the way that you could run your organization, run your team. And Jordan's even mentioned this with COVID and everything like that, with how there's no set guidelines to safety, to the, yeah, to the season, everything. But guess what? ESPN, Bleach Report had a cool, shiny ass graphic of the season starting, so everyone's excited. But then you got the guys like Jordan who are like, "I need to know: Am I going to be safe? Is my family going to be safe? How are we going to travel?" But there, he doesn't even know any of this. So I think well, it's so ironic. more importantly, just how about this? What the fuck's going on? Yeah, how true. about you just tell me what's going on? That's all I need. The other stuff I'll figure out, but just tell me what's going on. You know, like, I just want the battle for the bubble, the bubble bet. Like, you guys are going to profit off this, and you're going to go out and say that we can't do a bubble, and then all of a sudden you trademark things about a bubble. Like, it's wild. It's, it's absolutely insane. But yet we're going to lay all our people off. Like, you get furloughed. Go, just have a seat at home. Yeah, but the funny part about that is that <laughs> the executives weren't furloughed, though. So, you know, they, 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 they made their cuts elsewhere, but the, the big executives who are making these rules or non-existent rules and uh, like the standards who they're not even doing that. So what are they doing? You know, like what are they, what is their thing that they're doing right now during this? They have all this time. Now look, to go back to where we kind of started this whole thing, that's where it's hard to be a coach, right? Because I'm just speaking from like my own background. If I'm Fran McCaffrey right now, what I have to deal with, with my team getting COVID, like Jordan, you had COVID, like I saw that. Right. So like if I'm dealing with all that, that's really difficult when I got to stand in front of my team and my team and give them answers when I'm not getting anything from leadership. You know, like that's a really tough thing to do. Like, no, well, guys, we have to wear masks. Well, why? That really doesn't make a lot of sense. You know what I mean? Like, well, I, I've seen other teams practices like they're, they're, they're maskless, like they're not wearing masks, you know, like so like the fact that there's just this weird you get to make your own rules right now. Like, it's just kind of bizarre. I feel it is funny you bring the mask situation up. I was just talking to one of our managers and we have to, we're supposed to wear masks for workouts. It's mandatory for all Iowa sports, even if you're outside for soccer or whatnot. And it's funny because I was, I think it was Arkansas or Alabama. I saw one of their like preseason practice highlights or something, just like a 30 second clip and none of them are wearing masks. I'm like, what is, what's the point of what, like what's the NCAA doing right now? There's no consistency on a plan if one school down south is not wearing a mask and we're supposed to wear a mask, what happens when season happens? How can you trust where if everyone if everyone's following protocols, there's just no plan set up for for consistency? So let me help you with this real quick. And this is going to be a terrible take, but I'm just going to be very transparent and honest. This is like literally putting things on the forefront for the NCAA. OK, so, Jordan, how can they monitor how many hours people are actually practicing? All compliance. But there's you're right. They can't. Right. Right. It's, it's like if they can't monitor this and make this consistent, all those other things that you're supposed to care reports, are they going to clap? Of course they're not. Like, but right. heaven forbid, you know what I mean? Like a little school does something different, then it's a problem. They can't monitor any of it. Like there's not enough people. It's just the, the most. So I obviously had to deal with the NCAA in a little different regard than most people. And what I ended up saying to them at the end of the whole thing is I, 
I would have benefited more if I lied to you guys and for telling you the truth. <laughs> and they were like, what? I go, you heard what I said. If you'd have called me and I would have lied and said, I have no idea what's going on, I wouldn't be sitting here right now. But because I told you the truth and the other parties who did something wrong all agreed together that it didn't happen, I'm getting fucked. And they're like, well, we can't prove it. Well, no shit, but I told you the truth and I'm getting fucked. So I would have been better off to lie to you about it. And they had no answer. They had nothing to say. The whole thing about that is ironic too because you said coaches are supposed to be these people who are not just teaching you the game. They're teaching you life lessons. They're trying to get you to be a better man or a woman. And you have these guys literally just lying to the face of the NCAA. And they're the people who are the standard for college basketball, right? For for college yeah. football, for stuff like that. And it's so funny that this whole shady business has these people at the forefront are supposed to be these these people with great morals and who stand up for the right thing. And like you're saying, people don't realize that sometimes you're better off just lying because when you say the truth, you get screwed over. Yeah, and there's so much money involved, right? Like, to be honest, like with football, I mean, there's just so much. And it's not just like paying for that sport. It's paying for all the other ones. You know, like, so my company, Spotter EDU, we do automated attendance for um, student athletes and now regular students. And I was talking to a couple presidents in the SEC because a lot of Southern schools take our product. And I'm like, if I was you guys, I would have a meeting with my Olympic sports and I would say, listen, we're not going to play this year. We're going to have football play. But we're going to renew your scholarships moving forward, you know, and then we're going to pay for your grad school because we're going to make $160 million when we normally break even. And God knows now is not the time for you guys to go in the job market, right? Like there's not a lot of good jobs out there, so we'd much rather have you educate and we'll pay for it. But we're not going to play fall sports. That would be a great compromise, right? Like that seems to make sense. They're non-revenue generating. Let the revenue generator play and not have to pay out anything to anyone else. Just bring it into the school in the middle of a pandemic like, that seems to make sense. Obviously, there's certain rules and regulations that wouldn't let that happen, like Title IX. But, like, that's what I would have done. You mentioned getting the education as just as something in the alternative for not playing the season and getting your education taken care of, which is great. Jordan's talked about, as anyone who's known, that he doesn't think that student athletes right. He think it's a college athlete. Basically, Jordan has the sense that, you know, we don't go, I don't go to Iowa to school. I go there to play basketball. What's your thought on that? Do you think that the student athlete is real or is it more a college athlete, like Jordan says, or where's that gray area? I definitely think they choose a school to play the sport at revenue generating sports. So football, men's basketball, I would say women's basketball. Like other than that, I think you're probably going to, again, take this for what it's worth. You're probably going there because of the university, the education you want to get, especially for Olympic sports. But what I always, so what I, one of the things that I'm more proud of than anything else is hundred percent of the kids that I recruited graduated. Cause the thing I always preach to them is like, I can't make you a pro. Like I can't guarantee that I can't, like, I can't promise you that you're going to be in the NBA. I'm going to help you get better. Like I can't promise you starting, like you're gonna have to earn that. But the one thing that you're going to do is you're going to get your degree because that's your payment here. You know, like at a university, like that's a student athlete's payment. And if you don't take advantage of that and the people that are guiding you and your mentors don't help you take advantage of that, then the whole system's fucked, you know, because they're not getting paid. Like that's their payment. And understanding that a lot of these people, 80% of them are going to walk out of here with college debt, never going to be able to pay it off for like 20 years or 30 years. You're not going to have to go through that, whether you play pro or you don't. So that was always like my thing with families. That was like my promise to them. Now, I would tell you that probably 75% of people like really value that. Do you have a little rebuttal with that, Jordan? What what do you think about the whole mostly kids choose schools based on education, things like that? Is that Olympic sports? Olympic sports, not for your like football and basketball by no means. Yeah. What? So talk about talk about this other 25 percent. Yeah, other twenty five percent that you think doesn't believe in that because I know there's there's I'm not I'm not ever here to bash the majority of college coaches, the amount of college coaches I've met through the process and people that I know are some of the greatest people that I've met and I know they work hard to try to provide for their for families sure. and have a solid job to like I said provide for their families and continue to help kids grow to young men. I want to know if how much you have dealt with that 25% and how much that has impacted you at all or some of these kids that you recruited? No, I would say that 75% of kids going to the division one level aren't there for the education. 25% are. Um, Okay. Yeah. I would say, no. So if I said that, probably I might, maybe I like said that wrong at the division one level. Like I don't care if I was at Fairfield, Western Michigan, Missouri, Xavier, DePaul, 
Michigan State, everyone thought, every freshman thought they were going to be a pro. Like, they were there to, like, everyone, I'm playing the division, I'm going to be a pro. Like, it didn't matter what level I was at. Like, that was a consistent theme. And a majority of the time, parents, like, no matter what level we were at, like, one of them thought that as well, too. Like, it was very unique <laughs> not to find that. And that's part of the problem, like, to be honest. Jordan, do you see that with your even your recruiting class or even future classes or even guys you know in the Big Ten or other divisions? Is that – do most guys when they go to college, is that really the first thing they thought is, you know, I'm going to get in the starting lineup, I'm going to get to the league and stuff like that? Or is there some type of – sometimes where guys are like, you know, I'm going to get playing time and work hard. We're going to be successful as a team. I could be a sixth man. Or is that usually the case? That's just, there's no – way, Jordan, if you say that's what they think, <laughs> You're just lying to people. There's, bro, Zach, there's not even the process that I'm going to be a starter. Like, being a starter is a given for these dudes. Like, they yes. think they're going to be a pro. I totally, totally agree. I think, no, I think Iowa, our school is a little different because we have a lot of guys that know their role and understand the pieces, how they fit in. But I have experienced people that coming in, believing they're going to be pro right away, they're going to start, and they really don't have to work for it. I was kind of the opposite way. I thought I was going to just be a role player and come in and just provide for the team whenever I could, and then I worked my ass off to get to the starting lineup my freshman year. So I was kind of the opposite way of kind of what he's talking about, just because how I came in and I had I understand the process. You know, I, I had the advantage of my older brothers. I went through it that they knew that they have to work really hard to try to get to break into the starting light up and provide for their team and do whatever they can if they want to do be in the starting light up. So I kind of had to learn that as a young age that I might not be playing. I might not be a true freshman in the Big Ten playing because that's really rare. You don't see a lot of freshmen, yeah. true freshmen that are in Power 5 conferences that are playing right away 30-plus minutes. It just doesn't happen. And if they don't, a lot of these kids just go and transfer somewhere else. And uh, Jordan – would you say that's – well, for you, obviously, you had a chip on your shoulder because of, like, what happened with your recruitment. Like, you totally got screwed, right? And then – For sure, for sure. You also got to hear about the bad days from your brothers, which most people don't know about the bad days. Like, they don't know that there's actually going to be tough days. And a lot – honestly, probably five out of the ten – five out of the seven are going to be tough, right? Like, you don't have great days all the time. So I think you knew all that. I would say that Fran McCaffrey, one of the things that I've learned about him, because me and him inevitably always end up recruiting like the same people. So I've got to know him very well, but he defines reality for people, right? Like he lets them know like, okay, you're coming in here and this is going to be like where you're going to play. This is our goal goals for you. It's not, he's telling you that you're going to come in and be the starting point guard and play 32 minutes a game and be a freshman of the year in the big Ten. Like he doesn't do that. For sure. And that's funny you bring that up because when he recruited me, it was about me going to a JUCO because there wasn't a lot of scholar- there wasn't any scholarships. We were, they were kind of waiting on recruits. So at the time, he was trying to do everything possible just to get me at the school. And his focus was always on instilling confidence in me and making sure when I get to the, get to the next level that I would have the confidence to be able to succeed. It was never, oh, you're gonna be promised this, and it wasn't more. But it was more about mentally being ready and not physically what do we have to offer which i admire so much about coach mccaffrey when i started getting to know him in the recruiting process coach carter brought up a good point with how there is almost this false sense of reality with these recruits like you said they i mean you said most of them come in they want to be a starter they want to make the league all this type of shit when someone comes up to you or like jordan said coach mccaffrey and they say you know this is going to be a role you're not promised to be the Zion Williamson, the star player, but you're going to have a role and you're going to be a part of the team and have a great opportunity to be a part of something special. And then you have a, a, a smaller school like a Fairfield or something like that where, you know, you could be the guy, you could be starting right away. Coach Carter, you've had a lot of experiences yeah. at different levels with all that type of stuff. Will that guy, uh, like what percent of the time will that player go to the bigger school and just have a, a, a small opportunity even uh, contribute or do they go to the smaller school to get the more playing time? Um, they get, they go to the bigger school. And why do you think that is? Well, just because everything that comes with it, right? Like, and I would be dumb as a small school to try to tell them to not do that because, like, who you meet that are alumni, the experience that you have. I mean, just traveling alone as a high major like school, like you don't ever have to play, and like the experience you're going to have over those four years is so different. You know, if you're in the Power Five in the Big East, like it's just a very different experience. Like the best player on a mid or low major team is not having the same experience as the last player on the team at Iowa, just to be fair. 
I mean, just training table, like how you eat, like where you live, you know, just things like that. And it's not anyone's cheating. It's just there's better facilities. It's a, it's a better way of life. Jordan, would you say that that type of mindset was something that you thought about when you went through your recruiting process with a uh, lower mid-major type school, like a UNI or something? And then were you, if you had the choice and there were like Drake or UNI wanted to offer you, I wanted to offer you, but you know, you probably had a better chance of cracking the lineup at those other schools. Was that type of experience that Coach Carter brought up something that you thought about during your process? I for yeah. sure, I for sure yeah, did. Hold on. Jordan, Jordan, hold on. He was going to come to fucking DePaul. He wasn't going to UNI. <laughs> like he was going to come to a Big East school because we were that. Just the exposure piece of it you're going to go for. Jordan, so you're trying to tell me that when you spouted all that shit last week about you and I and Drake and these revenge games and all this stuff, DePaul was going to offer you too? DePaul did offer me. Oh, okay. Okay. Sorry. Okay. I I, I must yeah, have misplaced my, my tiny violin. I'm sorry, Jordan. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, you couldn't, I mean, come on. I agree with him. He couldn't say that. You can't say that on a podcast when they, when they beat you last year. But I, I do. So it's, it's funny because you – you mentioned that, but I, like I said, I own what I touched on earlier about my brothers playing. They kind of, I kind of had that advantage. And yes, I kind of wanted, I wanted to go to a big school, and I wanted to be exposed to what my brothers at Wisconsin did, and even you and I to extent because Matt, they, he went to a mid major, but really when he was at you and I, he took that yeah. team, and they were a high major for three to four years when he was there, yeah, and they, he kind of turned that program around with that team he had, but. I, I always wanted to be someone that wanted to contribute to the team, and I felt fit where I all these schools were recruiting me, like DePaul, like Lehigh, like South Dakota State, and when Iowa came in, I felt like these schools I could contribute right away, and that was kind of I knew that's that's kind of how my mindset needed to be. It, it was definitely exposure as well, but contributing and trying to be on a successful team and set me up later in life was kind of where my first priority was you crushed it that summer though i did yeah i was and i was surprised i was surprised no one no one was out nationally recruiting me because i i thought i played really well and that was the best basketball i played going into my senior year you just played on a bad circuit though right because at the end of the day like where you play is really important like if you're playing ey like if you and you would have because you dominated every game that i watched you play if you'd have played on a high level adidas circuit or a high level nike it would have been wild, like your recruitment. And I but totally think uh, we had this. We had the team and talent that Hank Huddleston and Martin Brothers. He he yeah. gathered a team together that we ended up winning nationals that year. Granted, we didn't play against Nike or Adidas top schools, but we dominated competition all the way going forward. And I thought we had a team that could contribute to an EYBL circuit or Adidas circuit. You so it's fine for sure. Yeah, for sure. And it's funny you bring that up because it's all about exposure and and. <laughs> in AAU, if you're yes. if you're not at these top tournaments, you're not going to see these top level coaches more than likely. And so now to take it full circle, Zach, this is kind of what as coaches you prayed on is the fact that like okay, you know that from AAU, right? Like it's all about exposure. So as yeah. a college coach in the Big East or the Big Ten, what are you going to sell? We have you're going to get exposure. Every game is going to be on TV. You know what I mean? Like mom and dad, you don't have to travel. Like you can stay home and you're going to be able to see your kid play. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I to for my perspective and standpoint i there's a lot of shit that people don't even see from the average person the fan and stuff like that that there's so many things that you can market on and sell on like you said that the exposure and not having to travel and stuff like that and it's so funny because for me i was a marketing student at iowa and i learned a lot of cool stuff there but just speaking with you and your experiences and stuff like that i feel like you almost got a full like another like, master's in marketing working with recruiting and stuff like that it's so funny how the NCAA, it's not a business, it's not a business, but you learn so much stuff in the business realm from just oh, being exposed to it. For sure. The best thing you can do in any profession that you're in is you learn the rules, right? You learn the parameters. And then when you know those, it's very easy to operate in the gray because you know the rules, right? No matter what you do, as long as you know the rules, you could be, you could be a person that does guys' taxes, right? Like they know the rules better than everyone else. They know where you can cut corners. They know the gray area. No matter what profession you do, when you learn that, you can be successful. So you mentioned, kind of, I want to go back to the DePaul situation that you dealt with and kind of how you've dealt with it the last couple of years yeah. and kind of say whatever you want to say and how, how the fallout happened and what occurred. You don't know, say, say anything specific, but um, how frustrated you were going through that and 
and telling everyone kind of the truth of what what happened and kind of going beyond that as well. So the Paul thing was difficult because like Dave Leto is one of my best friends and I had recruited a lot of players there. So I got brought in from Xavier as the associate head coach. And during my last year there and right around December, we had a whole bunch of players, parents, and they came to me with like mental health things. I think my kid's suicidal. Like what's going on? Like why are like, just, it was a dark place. Like it was not a great place to be at that point. So I end up, long story short, I end up going to the athletic director in a one-on-one and telling her what was going on against a lot of my mentorship, telling me not to do that. Cause you're literally going against every code of ethics and coaching, but like my player's mental health is probably more important than anything else. Yeah. Fast forward end of the year, the head coach, Dave Leto, who was me and him were great friends tells me he wants to get rid of the whole staff except for me. He goes to the athletic director, says that. She says, well, you know your associate head coach tried to get your job in December by saying mental health problems, blah, blah, blah. So I get three months later, they come back to me and say that I'm using my app at the school, which really wasn't going on. We had stopped using it when they, three, three months prior, so I'm probably like rambling a little bit here. And I have a meeting with the athletic director and my head coach, no, no human resources, and they can say I can either resign or be fired. I choose to obviously resign. Um, and then from that point forward, things got really crazy because they filed an order of protection against me with this, uh, what, county court, because I didn't agree with the violation from the NCAA and they were trying to ruin my character. So yeah, it was, it's been an interesting three or four years. How how much has have you learned like throughout experiencing things with NCA? Um, any shady situations that you experienced with going That's through shady. the coaching process? The hardest the hardest thing with the NCAA is they don't have power of subpoena in anything that they do. So like they can't go get your phone records. They can't go. They that they, 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 they can't do that. They're an organization, right? They're not the court. They have no affiliation with it. So. They're going to go off what people say or what they can get. And a lot of times that doesn't give them a lot of evidence. So basically what they're waiting for is think about like the mafia. They need an informant. And obviously like in coaching and in college basketball, what does what everyone preach to everyone? You have to be loyal, loyalty, loyalty, loyalty. You can't got to be loyal. So like if you can't get an informant, you're done. And that's inevitably what happens to the NCAA all the time. They just can't get someone to comply and then someone to agree with that because it's a hard thing to do. And you're saying that's probably what happened with all the FBI situation and investigation that came out. And we haven't heard it literally. I think only two coaches went to jail because of it. And I don't think, I don't don't know exactly what their charges were, but they shouldn't have like those people shouldn't have. I'll give you the greatest NCAA story that I have. And This you'll you'll love this. Like you guys, you two guys will love this. Okay, I'm at DePaul, and the NCAA wants to meet with me about violations that could have happened at Xavier. So they come up and they meet. I'm like, I was told I have to meet with them. Blah blah blah. And this is great. I meet with them at a restaurant, like a diner. So like, it's not like you're in an office. Like you're, I'm at a diner having breakfast with these two NCAA guys, and they start asking me questions. You know, and I had been told before. Whatever they ask you, they probably have the answer to. And to be honest, we really didn't cheat at Xavier. So, like, I was kind of intrigued to see what they were going to say. But as we're going through the whole thing, like, we we meet for two and a half hours. So we're sitting there talking and talking and talking. And at the end, they asked me, well, what advice would you give us if we're trying to bust cheaters? And I'm like, well, this isn't, I think, I go, I think you guys are missing, like, the the, the most obvious thing possible. And they're like, well, well, do tell. And I'm like, okay. I'm like, well, you guys have, you know who are Pell Grant students, right? And they're like, right. well, yeah, well, what does that have to do with it? Cool. No, just hear me out. You know who goes on road trips? You have a ticket list because all the kids have to turn it in, correct? Well, yeah, but where are you going? Well, tell me how someone who's on full Pell can have their whole family at the Battle for Atlantis. Like, if the whole family's there for Battle for Atlantis, how the fuck did they get there? The plane tickets, the hotel, it's more expensive than what they make a year. <laughs> like... Why are they there? So, like, if you're at a Kentucky or Duke and your family's at every game and you're a full pal, someone needs to tell the NCAA how that's going on. Like, that's a very good place to start. And you know what they told me? I swear to God, this is what they said. We don't like it when people move social classes. I go, I go excuse me? 
They're like, well, yeah, you know, we don't like it when someone's like a mid to mid plus and they're trying to like making waves. So like, and I'm like, that's the craziest shit I've ever heard. I go, you should never say that to anyone again. And I left at me thinking to myself, why would I not cheat? Like, it's better off for me to cheat. Cause even if I get caught, like I, I benefit from it until then, like I could actually make it somewhere. Not just, you know. Do you even think it's considered, I mean, when the whole FBI investigation came out, I thought it was complete BS anyway, because these kids have been making money since, I mean, there's movies about it. Like Blue Chips came out how long ago? 60, it feels like 60 years ago. I don't know, 1980 or something. And like, it's been happening for a while. All the dudes that got busted from the FBI, I know very well. None of them are bad people. They're not. They're just doing and, a job. They're just doing a job. Do you really think those people, the FBI thinks messed up because the FBI actually gave them the money, which is so crazy to think about. But like, if they were just getting the money, like, do you think they're taking that out of their own account? Like, they're not getting that, like, they're not doing that and paying it out of their own pocket. Like, it's coming from somewhere else. Like, and they're legitimately trying to help people. And obviously they have their own objective. They're trying to get them to come to the school. I get it. But the whole, like, you're bribing someone and trying to, that's so dumb. They're literally dollar signs to I mean, myself as well dollar signs to universities and NCA. so it's crazy to me to think about coaches they're trying to make livelihoods for their families and they're basing it off 18 to 23 year olds they're gonna want to do what's gonna it has to take and if <laughs> there's no there's no regulation or like we talked about earlier to how to try to stop it so i don't understand after all these years they come out with this last year and try to make it as big as a deal and nothing really happens from it. So the name, ima name image and likeness thing is interesting because I've actually seen the three proposed rules um, that all the coaches are voting on right before COVID. Like this was literally right. Cause I was ironically, I was going to try to start a name image and likeness company to support kids and try to get them to understand like how many followers you have on platforms matter. And like what you say is going to be a big deal later on because, you know, you could profit off this if you understand how to like manipulate the market. The rules are the dumbest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> so it's like you're reading them and you're like, wait a minute, they can sell their practice jersey, but their practice jersey can't have a logo on it. <laughs> well, how many fucking practice jerseys don't have a logo on it? Like none. <laughs> like, duh. Like Nike gives you the jersey with the logo on it. So like this doesn't make sense. And then the better one was the institution can't, work with the student athlete to help with name image and likeness so now we go back to what i said before about the high v and the trader joe's well if you just let the institution be a part of it they can say hey jordan you can't do this with trader joe's because it's going to affect high v however we have you lined up to do this this and that that's called normal like business that's how businesses work but the ncaa says the institution can't have any control over it however they got to monitor it because God knows they're not going to, because that means they'd have to work. Also frustrating for me to think about the, the compliance office. So I've been have many meetings with the compliance office just because of, I mean, the rug situation, um, the shoe situation. And I've, I've told the line a bunch of times with compliance violations. So, and I feel bad for these, these guys that are in the compliance offices because like I said, they're, they're, just like how NCA, not the executives, but the workers that got for law, like they're they're guys that are that are trying to make a livelihood for their families, and they're not they're just doing what they're told. And kind of like the compliance office, they hit they really no leadership from the NCA. They're just doing what they're told. And when I had a situation with their shoes, it was really just them worrying about me being eligible, and they thought that it was a, it was a dumb rule too. Like why can I not raise money for? fundraising for the children's hospital like it doesn't make any sense like why is that a violation i'm using and it's just because i'm using iowa logos and it's going to be an nca violation because of that so and after that i kind of realized that if this is going to be a big deal now like i don't see name image likeness ever getting to the point unless there's a really one a, a boycott with college athletes or something that kind of shows that they need to have this happen to benefit themselves and try to help them in the future it's like at the end of the day i think and you've alluded to this on other podcasts is just having an athlete's voice present when they're trying to come up with these rules or like regulations for it, like, or have coaches there that legitimately understand it or bring out like heaven forbid you outsource to like one of these Instagram people that get it and understand how name image and likeness works. And like, Hey, you got what, here are the pitfalls, here are the advantages, you know, like God knows that would only make sense. We are in higher education. 
But like, they don't think of any of those things. Like they just come up with rules. And it's really bizarrely weird that a group of people aren't, they're just not better at their job to be, <laughs> to be very transparent and fair. So, I mean, it's just the NCA executives. They're just, it's always just feel, I feel like it's for show. Like just like the name image likeness that came out six, seven months ago that they said they just made a big announcement that said they're going to start a committee and look into it. And then nothing has really transpired from it. I just feel like it's always, just like with the starting day to college basketball. That's great. You guys have a start day for college basketball, but how's that going to happen? Where I mean, the season's coming in a month now. There has to be some communication for a plan that's going to happen and not wait last minute and have like a football situation that happened this year with the Big Ten and Pac-12. And now they're they're going to play a month later after everyone started playing. It's just it's just ludicrous to think about how it's always about just pleasing the public and that's been their main goal since the start i feel like and in, at the end of the day as a student athlete you're sitting there and you're blaming the people like and i you're not because you get the big picture but the masses are saying well why can't our university get this right and so is the fan base and it's like well wait a minute it's not your university it's the people above them like it's those guiding people like the big 10 office or the ncaa because the big Ten's waiting for the ncaa and it's just like we're waiting and waiting and waiting. It's like sooner or later, the season's going to start. Like, can, again, could you imagine as a player, like you don't go over a scouting report or practice about the other team's like plays. And then you get to like pregame and Grant, coach McCaffrey's like, Oh, and by the way, they run flex. Good luck guys. You know, like it's not going to happen. We get eaten alive. We'll lose by 30. You know, it's just wild. Like that's not how the real world works. But however, right now that's what's going on. The one thing I will say about the NCAA, in fairness to them, and I do think this is a valid point, is I don't think athletes in the revenue-generating sports value education like the NCAA thinks they should. Just my opinion. So, like, I think they do a lot of things saying, well, they're getting their education for free. And I don't. where the disconnect is is the people that they're speaking to don't really view – they don't view that as, like, a profit. They almost view view that as a loss because they have to go to class and they really don't want to be there. I, I agree with that too as well. I think there's a lot of college athletes out there that come to college and they're focused on sports and they don't realize the realm of things where they're going to need a degree later in life. But it's hard to kind of get that mindset from the NCAA when they do all these things kind of to counter, counteract what they preach from education is important, but you know we're going to be – playing games all through winter break and this is all about basketball we're gonna be playing on christmas and a hawaii tournament we're gonna to be traveling on the weekday to go play penn state and miss three days of classes like it's it's hard to you know kind of understand that perspective when there's all these things that i mean just like football there's how many schools are online and then there's football kids that on campuses right now um playing playing sports to make money for the for the, for the universities is, is kind of just like I said, kind of counteracts what their argument is sometimes. There is so what I do, obviously what I do now dealing with both sides of higher education, athletics and academics, meaning just regular students. Just to be very clear, there is a huge disconnect between those two on every campus in America. You know, like so, professors in general don't necessarily look at athletes like they should miss a class, or and it's like, well, wait a minute, like part of your salary is coming from this athletic department budget. You know what I mean? Like you, like uh, what, what has boggled me is when COVID hit, how quick could we turn classes to online learning? I mean, you'd have been shocked. Like those things were online in a week, right? But you're telling me for the last 15 years when an athlete went on a road trip, he couldn't watch his math class online. Yeah. Like what's the problem? You have cameras in every room. Like, why wouldn't you have that person be able to tune in? Now, here's the thing, and this comes down to recruiting because I actually made this pitch to a couple schools. I would have came out and said, I'm not chartering anymore. I don't need to. I'll take commercial flights because my kids can learn online. They can do distance learning. We don't have to get back in a, in a rush. Because the only reason you charter is because you've got to make get it back, back class, right. right, for class. And mind you, we're going to charter and get back at 6 a.m. God knows a lot of people are going the next day. You know, like everyone's going to get up at nine and go to class and they got in at six, but it's recruiting more than anything. You're telling people you charter. So that's like the main, like those are like disconnects between both sides. And in all honesty, a lot of times when you recruit student doesn't come into mind, it's athlete because of what we talked about before, 
the majority of the population you're trying to get to come to your school, no matter what level you're at, thinks they're a pro, and so do their parents. So you're not selling, like you're selling it, but you're not, if that makes sense. I do want to touch on this topic. We can try to transition to this about parenting and college basketball, and we can wrap up the show uh, pretty soon after this. But I, I really want to know your opinion and about how much parenting and trying to transition from high school, because you know all these parents they obviously love their kids and they want them to be successful. But what happens when they don't play and they're going through rough patches and they – you know, have they called your coaching staff before when you've been coaching at various places across the country? Have you dealt with any major parenting issues and how much has that, or if any, played an effect in college basketball? I mean, it definitely does, depending on how strong your leadership is, right? So if your leadership's strong, they normally already have like preempted talks because you have a plan. So you know so-and-so is not going to play and you know who's important in their life and you talk to them about it. You know, then you have other people who don't like those conversations. So then you have to deal with issues later. Again, from where I started with Coach Izzo, Coach Izzo has an open door policy no matter what. So like if a kid wants to come in, if a parent want to come in, like whoever, says, hey, you coach, like he's always available. Like you can call his phone, like, and he'll literally talk about whatever you want to talk about. You just have to bring it. Like if you don't bring the goods, like if you're calling a bitch about playing time and you really don't have a gripe, he's going to tell you the truth. And he's going to tell you why. So as long as you handle it that way, no one really can complain about it. It's those people who, again, recruited you fictitiously and told you things you didn't want to hear that the lie continues to snowball. Right. That makes sense. And I feel like a lot of college coaches, I didn't really realize it at the time, but they deal with parenting. Like Parenting is an issue at some schools, I feel like, from what I've heard and experienced, because kids, they can play. You know how kids can be in college athletics if they don't get playing time they're going to complain to the parents the parents are going to get pissed might end up transferring or threatening transferring there's always that conflict that can happen between the parents and the coaches and i i kind of realized that as i went forward and kind of talking outside our team and other conferences and you know why why is why is this player playing bad you know is he upset at playing time like there's so much going into it of why there might be a bad night that a player not might not be playing good you know so to me that's where i think the ncaa makes another mistake is they really like depend on these coaches to know everything that's going on in kids' lives, but yet they limit access to the kid's family. So like if I'm the NCAA and God knows these schools bring in enough money, I'm telling like, I'm telling a high major school, no, no, we have a charter flight. I mean, Jordan, how many charter flights are you on that have 30 or 40 extra seats? Almost everyone. Okay, so why don't they have the families travel with them? Like, if you want me to know as a coach, if a family is getting money from an agent, then have them fly on my flight, have them stay in my hotel. I mean, how many buffets have you went through at Iowa that was empty and no one else could eat? None. You could have had 30 more people eat, right? So, like, why not have the families go with the team, stay in the hotel, fly back? I'm going to know if dad has a new Rolex. I'm going to know if dad's driving a new car. (laughs) You know, I'm going to know those things. But right. if you don't let me talk to him, how do you, am I a fucking like magician? Do you want me just to figure, I mean, how am I supposed to figure that out? Like if I'm not around him, you're held accountable to knowing that and you shouldn't. You said before too, how the NCAA doesn't see themselves as a for-profit organization. We know that's a lie and we know that there's different ways around it where they, obviously they're making tons of money. They're making tons of money on March Madness, college football playoffs. And we saw how much that hurt the NCAA with no March Madness last year and the millions of dollars they Uh, left on the table because of everything and I think it's funny because you said that why don't you have the the players families on the plane that makes sense right but someone says oh so-and-so's family got to go to this and they stayed in this hotel and this and this the NCAA will probably say where are we getting this money from you know how who's paying for this and stuff like that when it's actually funny because the least they could do is provide those type of things for the families and stuff like that. Well, here's what's wild. It wouldn't cost anyone any more money. For a charter flight, you pay 50 grand. You could have one person on it or 700. It's costing $50,000. Now, you'd have to buy some more hotel rooms. I get it. But like for food, okay, it's $1,000 more, whatever. But again, you're holding us accountable to knowing this information. But if I go, if I go recruit a kid at Lindmar, I can't go have dinner at Jordan Bohannon's parents' house. That's a violation. And God knows I definitely can't take him out to dinner. Heaven forbid. 
That would be like the, the biggest, yeah. don't buy him some chicken wings. From a coach's perspective, what, what is that? How, what do they tell you as a violation? For example, if you went to take someone out and they said, you can't take a recruit out or a player out to get food or something like you said, or get chicken wings. What's the negative effect of that, that they have like, taught you? As you coaches? have to know the rules that you're playing in. So again, when I first started, you could never take anyone out for anything, right? Then you could, there's unlimited meals. So like now you can take someone out to eat. So as long as you know those parameters, like you know you know the consequences that come along with it. I mean, you're gonna get suspended a game or you're gonna get docked recruiting days. Like, I mean, honestly, to be very transparent, they're really stupid, but yeah, that's, that's the NCAA for you, it's fun. Well, Coach Carter, I appreciate you coming on. I, I feel like we could talk for hours and hours about a lot of experience that you've had in NCAA topics and controversies and everything that happens inside because you know so much and have so much knowledge and been around so so many great people in the coaching and basketball college basketball so uh i really appreciate you coming on i think this was a great episode it kind of opens the eyes i know zach <laughs> said holy shit a couple of times just what what you said and what you experienced so i appreciate you being open book to us and um, I do telling us all your experiences that you've had. I do have a question for you though. I actually have two questions for you. So you got to, yeah. I mean, you got to kind of play along cause I'm on your podcast. So I do got two questions. One, how are you going to handle pressure? Cause I, I believe pressure is privilege. So like, how are you going to handle the pressure of this season? Because in my mind, I would have to say that you guys have to be the favorites, right? I would like to think so. <laughs> right. Well, Jordan said they should be number no, one ranked agree. if you read no, his I last uh, I little they, thing. I mean, with what you guys have coming back, like you're what, what are you 38 at this point? 32, like you're a veteran of the game, <laughs> but no, like, how are you going to handle the pressure of this year? Like, especially like, in my opinion, I think it's whoever handles the virus, the best win or gives themselves the best chance to win. Which is sad. Cause you bring that up and coach McCaffrey's touched on it a lot. And it's about, he said that it's about accountability this year and people knowing where your teammates are going and who they're around. It's about sacrificing things. And that further goes along the topics of the NCA and how much we're considered, I mean, deemed employees. Like this is a job that we're going ourselves into pretty much with the with COVID that's hit, and we have to be locked in and focused on basketball. We really can't go outside the fo- out, outside the bubble of basketball, even for classes. Like we could catch COVID at classes, then we could be twenty one days. The player could be out for twenty one days. days. Twenty one days. Twenty one days. Done. Yeah, that, that's that's what yeah. that's what uh eight nine ten games maybe depending on how your schedule is so, looked at like, and think about that like right there so you're telling me a bad decision by one of your teammates can then help minnesota or help illinois or you know what i mean or help like help michigan state or michigan because for 21 days three people can't play now Here's what's crazier, and again, this is probably going to help you guys like fuel this fire. That's not the case for the MAC. It's not the case for right, the Right, or the SEC. I think SEC, yeah, it's they're not, 10 days or not, something like that. Yeah, It's all different. So you get to choose your own rules. Now, good for the Big Ten. You know what I mean? Like, they're coming out with this strict rule. Will it hurt them? Will it help them? I don't know. Like, we're dealing with college kids. No offense to you, Jordan, at this point. Like, Probably you're going to have some guys make some poor decisions, I would guess, but they're idiots. Yeah. I mean, yeah. for sure. And I don't mean just that. I mean, everybody you're in college. Like I was in college. Like if you're going to try to like make me stay in a room and only go to class, what are you, what are you fucking nuts? Like there's no way. This gonna happen. <laughs> right. Like it's just not going to happen. Like I'm in college. I don't care. I mean, you even saw that at the NBA bubble. There's Lou Williams went outside of it just to get chicken wings was, at the strip club. Well, maybe, yeah. Just to get the wings are great there. I, I have heard magic city <laughs> wings are good. You, it's funny you say that because Jordan is the exact uh, example of you tell a kid, no, it makes them want to do it. <laughs> you think? Well, cause you know what you have to end up like, and this is kind of why I asked the questions asked the question earlier, like in order to be a champion, you got to be willing to give up something, right? Like no matter what, like if you want to be a champion, you got to get, you have to sacrifice something, whether it's the regular season, like meaning non COVID or now. So now more than ever, it's like how dedicated are you are to the cause? And I think you guys have a unique situation because of you coming back from the injury. Obviously, what is it? Luca Garza coming back and he easily could have went pro. You have the family dynamic with your, coaches kids on the team i think you guys have a great like time to be able to say you know what we're willing to give all this up because of this family atmosphere 
And to me, that's right. kind of what I'll end on on this whole thing. What I always thought was ironic about college basketball is that you would get in the middle and you'd say family on three, and there's only a select group of teams that I was around, but that really was real. Actually true. That's so true. Everything else is bullshit. Oh, family on three. Let's all go do our own thing and not really care. You know, like, but right. whoever <laughs> figures out what family means, you can do something special, and it's never been more relevant that you have to sacrifice right now in order to win a championship. Well, Coach, thank you for taking the time, like Jordan said, to come on here and really explain everything. It's great to have someone from your level and your experience come and basically just pick apart, you know, our brains and your brains. And I think everyone who's listening is gets to see a little more into the business. Just show us how people about how crazy it is to navigate it, whether you're a player or a coach. There's no really easy point to be in it. So thank you everyone again for listening. Uh, make sure to rate us five stars on Apple. Uh, give us a good review, please. And make sure to keep uh, interacting with us on social media. We look forward to releasing more episodes with great guests. So thank you guys. And have the rest of your day.